Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching the Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Vice President M. Venkaiah Naidu on Monday said that India, which represents one sixth of the global population, has a rightful claim to the permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council. One of the key historic reasons for India's quest for a permanent seat at the UNSC was to ensure protection of national interests in crucial diplomatic moments when the organ takes up issues such as Kashmir. Delivering a joint G4 statement on behalf of Brazil, Germany, India and Japan, India's permanent representative Syed Akbaruddin in 2016 stated that the grouping was eager for a forward discussion on UNSC permanent membership and reforms. Diplomats have blamed China for having quietly carried out a campaign to stop India's efforts at the UNSC. Veteran diplomats have said that the latest UNSC meeting on Kashmir, which was convened following an initiative from China, showed that India will have to show more stamina to stop China from using the organ against India's interest. The issue of expanding the UNSC and the text-based negotiation is expected to be taken up yet again in September when the UNGA uh, session takes place. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze UNSC reforms and a permanent seat for India. Joining me on the program today are Harshvi Pant, Head, Strategic Studies, Observer Research Foundation, Pramit Pal Chaudhary, Foreign Editor of the Hindustan Times, and Anil Trigunayat, former Ambassador. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador, I'd like to begin the program with you. What are your thoughts on uh, India being a permanent member of the UNSC? Well, we should have been a permanent member quite some time back. And uh, India deserves, and what the Vice President said is one-sixth of the world population. And it is not only the population. India has been a founder member of the United Nations. And we have been always uh, respecting the institutions, participating in the institutions, uh, and uh, always supporting the United Nations as an institution, so that it just doesn't remain a talk shop as some countries do it. Uh, but at the same time, we know that it is not an easy job in every country. We, each of the countries that are aiming to become a part of the high table uh, have certain uh, countries that are opposing them. India is opposed by China and Pakistan. Uh, Germany is opposed by UK and uh, France. And uh, Brazil is opposed by Argentina. And like that, you know, all the four countries which are the key members. Then the African countries, they haven't come up with their candidates. Uh, two candidates. So there have been a lot of discussions going on. Uh, but personally, I feel that um, India has to continue to make the efforts. And there is a broad consensus that India needs to be there. Japan needs to be there because they are funding uh, the United Nations quite a bit, substantially. Uh, but at the same not time... Not just funding, India sends several not India, troops as I'm well. I'm talking both. about the, yeah, uh, Japan, Japan yes. essentially. But India, of course, in the peacekeeping, India has been a leader in the peacekeeping operations and again upholding the UN uh, principles and credentials uh, there. Uh, but what happens is India is also a major, big economic emerging power. Now, India has generally followed an independent foreign policy that very often is uh, not seen by those powers who are sitting, those five members, uh, in sync with us, what we want, and some because we independently behave sometimes. Whether it was the, uh, the bombing of Libya in the recent past, I mean, we opposed it in the first place and then finally abstained on the vote. So they know it whenever India is there, India has a voice, India has a following. But today, if you come to see India's Clout in the United Nations has increased substantially, whether it was the election of the Indian uh, International Court of Justice, where the British candidate was uh, for the first time, uh, there is no British judge uh, on the ICJ, or for that matter, it was International Day of Yoga, which was 177 countries, the first time, and several Muslim countries have done that. So wherever we have tried to take a lead, we have succeeded in the recent past. And India is trying to provide that kind of a lead. And I, I hope that uh, a, a critical mass will eventually occur. But let's not be in any doubt that none of the five P5 countries, France has recently said that India, it is a strategic need that India should be at the high table. But at the same time, whether it's US, whether it's uh, Russia, whether it's China, all of them have their own angularities. Absolutely. Uh, when it comes to expanding the Security Council. Other reforms may perhaps succeed earlier. Right. So they wanted to, wanted to continue to be an exclusive yes. club of just five. All right. Uh, Pramit Pal Chaudhary, so 
India is not alone, like the ambassador just pointed out. There are three mm -hmm. other countries yeah. as well. Brazil is one of them, Germany and Japan, who want a permanent seat at this particular table. Are the claims made by these four countries justified? Do they deserve a seat at the table? Well, the thing is that over time, when the original G4, group of four nations, as you mentioned, was created uh, in the mid-2000s and the campaign began, um, by the end of the first round of campaigning over about three years, three years India realized, and I remember the then Foreign Secretary uh, uh, actually was briefing us on this. He said that we began with the belief that India was actually the weakest of the four candidates in terms of its support. By the end of the campaign, we realized actually India was the strongest candidate. The problem is that the candidacy for both Germany and Japan has actually declined oh, since then. Uh, in Japan's case, they have a basic problem that both their economic clout is, is declining uh, and China's opposition to Japan is now almost fanatical. I mean, China has basically said that there's, if there's one country we will never allow into the Security Council, it is Japan. Um, uh, and in fact, in private, Chinese diplomats have actually urged India, leave the G4 and perhaps then we can consider supporting you. But as long as you're part of the G4, we cannot support Japan. Uh, Germany, um, as is mentioned, Spain and Italy in particular have taken great objection to Germany's inclusion and Germany's economic clout has also been declining uh, within Europe. Uh, there's a lot of opposition in Africa and Latin America and Arab world to an additional European power. They said that why should Europe of all continents have now three Security Council permanent seats? Uh, that makes no sense. And at one point, which was true in the mid-2000s, there was talk of a combined European Union seat. But now with Brexit, that's obviously dead. Britain will not surrender its seat uh, uh, because it is one of its few remaining so sources of international prestige. So in that case, France would have to merge its seat with Germany, which France is unwilling to do as well. So you, the European case, therefore, has become is very difficult to sell overseas. Brazil remains obviously an obvious candidate, uh, though they have strong opposition from both Argentina and Mexico. Mexico's argument that their GDP is actually almost the same size as Brazil's, therefore they should be uh, eligible. And finally, as the ambassador mentioned, Africa has yet to make a call. Africa, has, we, we did not, it should have been a G5 group but we had asked the Africans to choose a candidate among themselves. We had dabbled with South Africa, which is economically the most powerful African country, but Nigeria is by far the largest. I mean, if you make the argument that India's population is the basis for candidacy, then Nigeria is overwhelmingly the African candidate. But Africa is deeply divided on this issue because the Egypt is another country that believes that it should be representing the African continent. Um, so therefore, Africa has gone absolutely nowhere in being able to come to an internal decision uh, about who, who should represent them. And that remains one of the biggest stumbling blocks to any forward movement on this because everybody always comes back to the, but who is Africa going to choose? And right. the answer is zero, we don't know. Sure, sure. So that having been said, uh, Harshi Pan, let's now look at the uh, permanent members of the UNSC and where they stand. Before we get to China, of course, let's look at some of the other countries that is the US, UK, France and, and, and so on and so forth. So what is their stand? You know, do they want to expand uh, the UNSC? Do they want more people? Do they want to be more accommodative or where do these countries stand? Well, I think, you know, international institutions reflect the balance of power uh, when they are created. So, clearly this is a balance of power reflective of 1945. But the reality of that, uh, of that institutional structure is such that you have to rely on the status quo powers to actually change the status quo. So, they are not going to change the status quo because it, it will, you know, it will uh, un underwrite in some ways the reality that we are all witnessing. We are witnessing the decline of the West in relative terms. And if you look at the three main parts there, uh, sitting there, uh, UK, France and America, they are not going to cede that because that will simply confirm uh, that the West is on a decline. And I, and I think that is where uh, the problem is stuck, that while they can pick and choose, you know, diplomatically to, for example, at times when you have visitors coming to India from some of these countries, uh, they say, well, we support India's case for a, for a permanent membership. But what does it mean in operational terms? What are they willing to do? 
to to support India's case? Are they willing to mobilize global public opinion in India's favor? No, in, India will have to do that on its own. And the, the, therefore, the question is uh, whether you have the, the, the three or four or five uh, members on the Security Council who on whose veto would depend the for future structure of that organization. Are they willing to, uh, to abide by the original uh, premise of the, of the UN Charter, uh, which somehow uh, you know, they argue is written uh, in, in ways that is both idealistic and realistic. It's realistic because it gave power to the five powers without whom United Nations would not have succeeded uh, or would not even have functioned if they were not part of that uh, power structure. So clearly now we are at an inflection point where the global power hierarchies are changing and that therefore there is an expectation that those uh, who are uh, you know who are on the decline would give up but but you know no you know we know you know if, if you know our history correctly we know that you know losing sight or losing powers or declining powers don't give up that easily mm. so how do you manage this transition i think that's where the debate is stuck uh, there is again uh, process has become more important than the reality Absolutely. So we, we keep on talking about how many times this issue has been discussed and how what kind of procedures are involved within the UN system, how many committees have recommended, uh, how many times that it should be reformed. But I think this is the most, this would be the most difficult part of the reform agenda. UN has reformed over the, over the last few years, but this will remain a reform which I think will belie us for some time at least. Okay, all right. Uh, taking the discussion forward now, let's look at China's role, Ambassador, and how China has been scuttling India's efforts at the UNSC? Well, China has uh, very clearly, in its own perception, has equated India with Pakistan. Pakistan is a stool, and it prevents anything against Pakistan that happens. I have sat through several meetings and I have found that they are very overt and very clear support of Pakistan like an iron friend or whatever they call it. But at the same time, the most recent incident was when China, on beh at the behest or uh, besiegement of uh, uh, Pakistan, called for the informal consultations. And that shows the need that if you are not in the room, you keep getting bashed. I mean, that despite the fact that you have all the friends, but everybody eventually uh, comes to know that, uh, okay, India has again been equated to Pakistan in this, which is what we should do always avoid being there uh, that China Pakistan is able to pull us down to their level that's what I say now China takes that stand and it tries to keep it a stop at, as if it is going to uh, create some kind of a problem and in the United Nations it has the vote so you cannot go against it will always uh, stop it so for India it is extremely important that it builds its constituency I mean in the UNGA generally we have a very good set of people and which was also clearly evident that at least 12 or 13 members of the current UNSC either did not react negatively to India or positively supported India. So France of course uh, is an avid supporter of India overtly. The Americans sometimes say the, the bigger country with biggest population should be there or uh, the Brazil they might mean in some place or they might mean the Japan they obviously support China does not support either uh, Japan or India. So, their phraseology which they use is uh, very interesting with the Chinese use. They would not say we don't su support India. Similarly, the Russians, when they come to supporting, they say yes, we, we want India to be there. But then the process, as Mr. Pan said, the process is what is very important. So, once you get going in the process, the takeaway point is that at the end of the day, none of them want hmm. to expand the table. Sure. That's precisely the case. They want everybody to get entangled into these webs. Uh, and don't want. In fact, India was also in favor of uh, continuing for, let's say, about 10 years or so without the veto. Mm -hmm. uh, be a part of the, uh, the uh, you know, UNSC and see how it behaves. That would have uh, been a starting point. But that again, there are many uh, problems within this, with the groups, different groups. L77 coming on the text-based negotiations that somebody won't agree. Like for example, out of the 122 countries who have given their comments on um, the the negotiations or the text, uh, of 113 support the reforms. 
Absolutely. including that of the UNSC. Sure. So we, we need to continue to work on it, but it is going to be a little bit of a long haul. Yeah, it's going to be a long yeah. process, but we need to continue to keep chipping yeah. away at that yes. and, you know, try, trying to do our best. All right. So, uh, Pramit, as far as this whole China issue is concerned and looking mm -hmm. at what China has <coughs> done in the recent past, especially calling for this closed door meeting, uh, you know, of the UNSC as right. far as Kashmir is concerned. Is it now time for India to look beyond the Wuhan warmth? and start giving it back to China. So the Wuhan warmth was always understood to be effectively a temporary truce. It's not that Wuhan was very clear. In fact, they, by calling it an informal summit, it was understood that India and China would not really address any of the differences and problems that face them, including the question of the Dalai Lama succession, the border, uh, the border disputes, uh, and or even the issue of uh, Pakistan or anything else. So Wuhan was effectively China and India agreeing that after the Doklam crisis, uh, they would agree to lower the temperature of a relationship that was deteriorating rather rapidly. And that was all it was because for India, given that we were going into elections, uh, we were happy to have not to have to worry about our northern border. And for Xi Jinping, because he was then in the beginnings of what is still continuing to be a very nasty trade war with the United States, he didn't want to have his southern flank, if you wish, uh, open up in front of him. And you'll notice that Xi Jinping did exactly the same thing with Japan at the same time. He then basically went to Japan and said, please, temporary, uh, I'm not settling Senkaku Island dispute, but I want to lower the temperature. He allowed Shinzo Abe for the first time to have a summit meeting on Chinese soil uh, and so on. So the Wuhan spirit was never about uh, the two countries getting along. It was just about the two countries agreeing not to get into each other's hair. That will continue, in my view, partly because we in India have other problems on our hands that we still wish to focus on. Kashmir, with now a new sh massive shift in our policy, we have certain economic concerns that we need to settle. Pakistan, China has still the same, same problems. They still have, a, now they're worried about their economy. They still have a problem with the United States. Uh, so they're not interested in getting into anything. But keep in mind that even what, during the spirit of Wuhan, we effectively had a proxy war, not proxy war, but a proxy struggle for the, for in the Maldives and in Sri Lanka. Right. Uh, and in other places where effectively we tried to overthrow each other's uh, uh, governments there on the basis of who they were aligning with. Uh, and there were a number of other, should we say, less, lesser known uh, struggles between India and China. So the relationship is not particularly strong and so obviously something like UNSC uh, is on a completely different level of, of trust and, and convergence which simply doesn't exist. Right. What I think is interesting right now when it comes to Pakistan, Pakistan's GDP in dollar terms now is less than the city of Mumbai. Okay, this is a country that's one-tenth of our GDP and falling further and further behind. China is now finding it increasingly difficult to keep bailing this country out because it's like a black hole. You put in $10 billion, it just disappear and they're right back to square one 12 months later. Uh, and it was interesting that, that it was the Chinese who told the Pakistanis, you have to go to the IMF and take the hard medicine that IMF is going to force on you uh, because we just can't keep paying for your country. Right. So the Chinese now keep talking, when they come to about Pakistan, it's partly yes, these are, this is our all-weather all friend and therefore we have to support them. But it's also, can you please have a dialogue with Pakistan, give them a break. Mm. So, you know, a very unusually Xi Jinping when Modi, when they met in the last summit, Xi Jinping actually went off the agenda and said, why don't you consider a dialogue with Pakistan? Even though he knew that Modi would have to say no. Right. Uh, but he still tried to make that plea, very unusually for a Chinese leader. Um, and it continues to be something they keep asking privately, why don't you consider something, mm. anything mm. Uh, with, with Pakistan just to take it, take it, just take it easy on these poor fellows. Just to take the heat off, basically. Take the heat off of them, yeah. yes. Yeah, all right, all right. So, Harshi Pant, so how do we deal with China's efforts to continuously try and rake up issues after issue at the UNSC? Well, I think, uh, A, uh, you know, we have to somehow, uh, especially after the after what, what has happened in, in, in Kashmir recently, um, 
we should expect that this would happen. We should, or, 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 you know, we should expect that this will continue for a while because, after all, uh, this is uh, the uh, you know this this issue lies at the very soul of Pakistan's identity. So, if Pakistan will make a human cry and Pakistan will expect its friends to take its uh, you know to to support its cause in the UN Security Council, but I think the realization that pa that China is more or less isolated in the UN Security Council is something that if you if you keep on doing that again and again to China, they, they come to a conclusion that they can only do so much. Mm -hmm. Remember Hafiz Saeed happened after a while. Lots of times uh, they, they, they continue to block India's case. Eventually they realize that they are so isolated that they have to give in. So I think at some, uh, you know, uh, a time will come when, you, when, when perhaps this would also happen. But as I think Pramit mentioned uh, in interestingly, that how do you how can china continue to equate india and pakistan in a context that's so radically altering and so rapidly altering in front of your eyes that if you are if if you if you need to retain diplomatic agility you need to find ways of of finding some traction with india and that's where you, i think uh, we look for the for uh, Xi's visit to india uh, in october which which would again be a continuation of the so called wuhan spirit and whatever happen, you know whatever happens there would also have a bearing on future conversations but i think it would be an important conversation to have uh, just to know where they stand today because we have seen a shift we are we are looking at that shift and uh, the shift is happening uh, because pakistan is is on the verge of an economic collapse the shift is also happening because china is feeling the pinch of the economic conflict that it is that it is facing from the us hmm. so there, 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 there are lots of things happening within china there are lots of things happening as far as sino pak uh, relationship is concerned but i think on kashmir in, in particular uh, this issue will continue to resonate uh, with uh, with pakistan uh, because of its identity and it will continue therefore to resonate to a, to a certain degree with china and therefore some amount of back and forth on this question uh, is to be expected but the silver lining is that that now if they if they see the kind of isolation 13 14 uh, members supporting india uh, India's case, or at least not siding with, with uh, on China on this, or not allowing a statement to come out. I think that's a massive signal that the issue, as such, does not have uh, much uh, traction within the larger international community. Sure. So perhaps China can uh, look at it differently, or China can start putting all pressure on um, on uh, on Pakistan itself. And we have seen a nuanced statement coming out uh, from China on this question itself, where they are more concerned about Ladakh; they are not concerned about Kashmir. So Kashmir. I think. They are now looking at it more in geopolitical terms, more in the sense of how do you take the conversation with India forward. Because if Kashmir becomes a defining issue, then they also realize that the conversation from the Indian side will stop. So I think they, they want that conversation to continue. And perhaps there are avenues there that India can uh, use and leverage. All right. Closing comments now from uh, all my guests with the best way forward. As far as a permanent seat at the UNSC is concerned, Ambassador, what can we expect from France? France has emerged as a very close ally in, the re in recent times. Uh, what, what's likely to happen there? Well, France is supporting openly, uh, as far as India's candidature is concerned. Uh, some others have, like Russia has said in bilateral dialogues and all, but at the end of the day, when it comes to the United Nations Security Council uh, discussions and reforms, they always say the process has to be done, it has to go through the system. And they all know that the process is very long, rather. China will continue to oppose India and probably will be the last one to agree uh, in the end. The Americans play up uh, different games. I mean, they would also know. And I think in the, in the background, even though they admit that India could be there, but they would like India to be the right side of them sure. rather than uh, having independent. And uh, I, I believe that uh, a time will come when India will be there on the table. But uh, I don't see an immediate possibility of sure. things moving forward the way we would like it to go. Absolutely. Yes. And Pramit, you know, what can we expect from the Trump administration as far as this uh, you know, UN, as, as far as India and the UNSC are concerned. See, the point with, the, with Republican administrations in general, why they don't necessarily have any problems with India becoming a permanent member. Republicans, by definition, are hostile to the United Nations as a whole. They are not simply not interested in the United Nations as an organization. So they're not prepared to invest any capital or any do anything with the UN one way or the other. Uh, so it's almost a waste of time to try to get a Trump who thinks the United Nations is just a wasted piece of real estate in Manhattan uh, to expect him to come out and fight on your behalf. Which is why it's probably more useful to get the Republicans to fight, you know, a Republican administration to fight for something like the Nuclear Suppliers Group or another multilateral agency 
in which they can see tangible reasons why India has to be part of. It's right. generally the Democrats who are more interested in the larger idea that the multilateral structure should reflect actual existing power. But I'll just say, you know, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, one time when we were flying with him, we asked him about the UN Security Council seat. He wasn't overly concerned about this. He didn't see this as a priority. He just said, if we can make our economy grow at 10% for 10 years, they will ask us to be a permanent member. So let's focus on that first. Okay, all right. And uh, Harshi Pant, close the show for us with your concluding remarks because let's not forget the UNGA session is, is to take place in September. Can we expect the issue of UNSC reforms and expansion coming up there? I think like every year it will, it will come up again. And I think uh, you know, the, those countries that have a direct stake in this conversation will take it forward. But I don't think, you know, this, this, this issue is generating that kind of energy today that it used to generate uh, a decade or so back. Because uh, countries have gone through the motions and they've realized that it's going to be much more complicated and much more treacherous uh, than they had expected. But I think the point uh, which, I, which India should concentrate on is that while we need to spend diplomatic capital on this question, we shouldn't be over-investing on this. Because at the end of the day, if you are economically, as, as Pramit pointed out, militarily and diplomatically important enough that you are part of every single important global conversation, then you somehow you know, alleviate uh, many of these problems. So clearly our intent should be that we should be part of all of these major conversations and we clearly are today by sheer, fact, uh, by sheer heft of our weight. Uh, uh, you know, uh, economic, political and military, we are part of most of these conversations and therefore international communities, uh, uh, the way it looks at India today is dramatically different from what it used to be a, a decade or so back. If, the, if these trends continue, then I think the, the, the reality of, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that India would, would be part of the P6 uh, irrespective of whether it is part of the P5 or not. <laughs> all right then. On that note, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it on this edition of The Big Picture. See you again next time.